Hello, everyone. Welcome. All right. I am so excited for tonight. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I hope you can all see me. <laughs> um, welcome to the 40th anniversary uh, celebration of Aunt Loot Books. It's such an honor to be able to be here in this Zoom room with you all uh, and get to enjoy the authors and writings that Aunt Loot has platformed. Um, my name is Emma. My pronouns are she and her, and I am the director of acquisitions and programming at Aunt Loot. Um, I think that the last few years have made it easy to really see and feel the hardship of our circumstances and how very far we have to go before patriarchal and racial violence and harm are treated with accountability. Um, but in this space with so many people who have felt Aunt Loot's impact and want to come together in community to celebrate and feel good, I am reminded that this is the medicine we need and this is the power of literature and of activism, and this is the alternative to despair. And I want to thank you all for being here, truly. Um, before we get to hear from our amazing authors and our artistic director, Shay Braun, and our executive director and co-founder, Joan Pinkboss, I want to acknowledge that Aunt Lude operates on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. And as the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramaytush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community, and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. This statement serves as an ongoing commitment to solidarity with the indigenous and first peoples here. I personally am currently located in Lishan Ohlone land, um, and I encourage you all to pop into our chat to share the land you're joining us from. Please pay your land tax if you haven't yet and you're in the Bay. Sugareite Land Trust runs the Shumi land tax and we'll include links in the chat. Um, and that's one way you can support the rematriation of this land. Um, but yeah, some announcements. Um, this event is being recorded and it'll be published online later this week um, and we'll send it out to everyone who is RSVP'd and we'll publish it on the Antloot website. So if you need to dip out, you will certainly be able to catch the full event uh, on your own time later. Um, and we have subtitles, but if you're having any trouble following them because closed captioning is weird, um, please send a message in the chat if you want any clarity on anything said. We'll do our best to make this experience as accessible as possible. Um, make sure you also try to stay to the end of the event as we have the biggest discount we've ever done at Ant Loot. And I want to share with you all the code for it in gratitude for your support. Uh, it's 40% off for 40 years of Ant Loot. So stay tuned for the details. But if you want to help make the next 40 years possible, please donate to us. Your contributions go directly to our authors, to our community, and to the maintenance of this organization. Uh, but without further ado, I welcome Shay Braun, the artistic and co-director of Ant Loot, to your screens. Thank you, Emma. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. It is a thrill for me to be here with you all to celebrate Ant Loot's 40 amazing years of feminist publishing, um, of which I've had the pleasure of uh, being with, and that was a really good construction, for 26 years. Um, over that time, we have accrued a, quite a list of things to celebrate and be thankful for. And I want to just take a couple minutes here and channel the spirit of Aunt Loot to express some of that gratitude and to send out some of those celebratory vibes. First, to the authors whose work is the heart and soul of our work. All of us at Aunt Loot are continually inspired by the breadth and depth of the wisdom, clarity, and imaginative vision represented by the authors who we have had the privilege to work with, <clears throat> some of whom we will be hearing from tonight. The stories they tell, the worlds they create and reveal to us are so critical to seeing and reimagining the world we share. 
As Gloria Anzaldúa wrote in Borderlands La Frontera, nothing happens in the real world unless it first happens in the images in our heads. And so thank everyone here and all of the Antlute authors for helping to transform and remake the images in our heads. Antlute is also incredibly and ongoingly grateful for the commitment and spirit of the now generations of feminists who have contributed to Antlute's mission as staff members and as interns. The press could not have survived without you, them, all of you. Um, not just for the necessary labor of bringing you know, a manuscript from the page, from, the, from, the, um, from a Word document into being a printed book and into the marketplace, but also for the even more necessary labor of continually reimagining what it means to be a feminist press, both as a cultural organization and as a nurturing workspace for all of us. Um, I would love to give the roll call of all of the amazing people who have worked at Aunt Lute, but I, I won't do that, but you all know who you are. Um, I particularly wanna call out our current staff. Um, shout out to Emma Rosenbaum, who we just met, Maria Minguez, Bianca Hernandez-Knight, and Frida Torres. So thank you so much for all the work you're doing to help Aunt Lute continue to thrive. And of course, all of this has been made possible by our intrepid, and remarkable Joan Pinkfoss, our executive director, um, who co-founded Aunt Lute with Barb Weiser in 1982. Um, I could go on forever about, about Joan's doing all of the sort of heavy lifting throughout these years, keeping a feminist nonprofit cultural organization alive um, through thick and thin. Um, she's been amazing, but I even more want to um, just point to the amazing legacy she's offered us in terms of like having a creating this press and this environment for centering women's voices and experiences and for the editorial practice that she has cultivated here that really infuses the work of Aunt Lou, um, where the, the sort of central principle is respecting kind of the voices and visions of the authors we publish and not dictating to them how that, how that ought to look. Um, to be more marketable um, or more, more palatable to a mainstream audience. So thank you so much, Joan. And last but not least, we are also here to celebrate you, the amazing community of readers who support the work of Aunt Lou authors and by extension, the work of the press. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Shay, thank you so much. I'm so excited to hear you speak about Aunt Lou because we never get to hear you talk about this. Um, uh, Joan, I'm also excited to bring you out here to say hello. If you could turn your camera on, it's such a pleasure to bring you to speak to our community. Well, this is where usually those of you who are familiar with uh, public television is where the gray hairs come on and ask for money. And uh, I just want to assure you that that's not what I'm here to do tonight. I'm here to celebrate with everybody else. This is just an amazing event created by our wonderful team. And um, I, I, the tonight is about celebration. And as someone who's been with Aunt Lute from the very beginning, I can say it's been an amazing ride. But tonight, these authors, besides being some of my favorite authors, bar none anywhere, have shown the importance of Aunt Lute's service to the diversity of voices and communities they foreground. Aunt Lute always survives on the edge, and perhaps that makes us more edgy, if you don't mind my saying that way. But we, it, it means we can't rest on our laurels and that keeps us doing what's important. So we're just so glad that you joined us tonight to celebrate with us about that, what you also think is important. And um, so I just simply wanna in echoing Shay and in the spirit of celebration, I just wanna thank all the interns, the donors, the decades of staff participants and everybody else including the audience for making Aunt Luke possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan. Um, all right, well, without further ado, I wanna hop into our readers and getting us started is Veronica Sandoval. Veronica Sandoval is Lady Mariposa, a spoken word artist and scholar slash trola from the Texas Rio Grande Valley, who has been writing and performing for over 20 years and her creative and academic writing has appeared in several anthologies and collections published by 
organizations like Ant Lute, University of Delaware, Lamar University Press, Texas A&M University Press, and Rutledge Press. Uh, she earned her PhD in 2022 from Washington State University in American Studies. And her research focuses on Chola labor, Chola agency, and an emphasis on Chicana feminist epistemology that centers Chicana legacies of resistance. Her dissertation is entitled Chola Work, a Genealogy of Homegirl Legacies of Resistance. Currently, she teaches writing and women's and gender studies at Portland Community College, Rock Creek. And while she is not teaching, reading, writing, or performing, she likes to spend time with her chubby vato and their gato named Boots. Welcome, Veronica. In the background, my partner just heard my bio and is laughing. Um, so thank you so much uh, at Lute for inviting me to be here. And thank you, Emma, for reaching out and organizing this uh, uh, along with everybody else at, at Lute and talking to me uh, to be here. I'm really excited. Um, so I am from the Rio Grande Valley. Currently, I am living in Wilsonville, Oregon. I just moved here two months ago, so I'm trying to remember where I live. Um, but we are coming from, or I am coming to you from the traditional village sites of Multnomah, uh, Kathlamet, Clackamas bands of the Chinook, Tulitan, Kaupuya, Mo Molala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. Uh, Mo the Multnomah is a band of Chinooks that lived in this area. Um, and so, yes, um, what I will be talking to you today will be about um, the book that has impacted me and changed my life, and I continue to do work around it and teaching it, which is uh, Borderlands. I'll be reading some pieces out of Borderlands and some pieces that uh, I wrote called, uh, you know, Postcards to Gloria, which which I continue to do sporadically through the years. Um, I, um, I want to say that no matter how far I get from the Rio Grande Valley, currently right now I'm like 2,325 miles away from Sullivan City, which is where I grew up. Anzaldúa's work and the impact of it continues to follow me um, all the way up to like my new gig at Portland Community College, where I'm teaching writing and women and gender studies. Um, one of the things that um, that I've been doing is actually using Anzaldúa's work to teach writing styles to uh, writing 115 students, which is Intro to Composition Studies. Um, and not only have I been using her work, I've also been using her poems and different items of Anzaldúa's work um, to encourage students to explore different writing styles. Um, and so um, a lot of you might have already heard this, but um, Anzaldúa was the first um, Chicana writer that I ever read that made me want to be an academic. And what I mean by that is that um, I, I knew uh, certain writing styles really inspired me, right? And and um, there, there was poetry and I loved poetry. There was writers that inspired me that was really dope. But um, when I read Borderless La Frontera the first time, I was like, damn, she's smart as hell. I want to be smart like that. And then I was like, I'm going to go get a PhD. I don't know what possessed me to say that, but I did. I went to get a PhD, um, but it was this book that made me want to tap into all of this discourse that I then ended up like finding myself doing in my PhD program. Um, and, uh, and so I'm from the borderlands, aside from Anzaldúa's work inspiring me to get my PhD, it was also Aunt Lute and the Anzal and Norma Cantu and, um, you know, the Anzaldueras all from uh, that do that put together the El Mundo Surdo conference that also like embraced me and my poetry even before I started doing uh, wanting to be a scholar it was like they embraced me as a poet um, and then like have guided me and helped me through the many years that I've been uh, around right and so I am going to read um, one of the poems that appears in the uh, El Mundo Surdo three right. Uh, that is one of my favorites to read, and I hope I can do it without going into a coughing, uh, into a coughing um, spree. And it's called "I Will Be Your Bridge." <clears throat> 
I am a drawbridge, an island of a woman, Chola rapping sub, whose poems are connected to some other America. I am a sandbar, and because you are so young, I will function as your bridge. Where I come from, no roads diverge in woods, only <clears throat> only rusty fences try to block, block out ancestry. Where I come from, culture and identity are not interconnected by English only. There is no such thing as one nation, one culture, one language. My poetry substitutes Shakespearean thou's for barrio howls, and sometimes 14-year-old 14, 14 girls get knocked up in the hood, and sometimes you throw in a cuss word or two, but caliche roads and mesquite trees do not stop my poem from being a poem. I am a drawbridge, an island of a woman. I am a sandbar, and because you are so young, I will function as your bridge. Where I come from, oh, sorry. Um, I am a drawbridge, an island of a woman, academic chola sub, whose poems are connected to some other America you don't think you can call your own. I am a sandbar, and because you are so young, I am going to function as this bridge, connecting you to me. Sisterhood becomes a singular utopian fantasy when I revolt you with my trolling Trojan mula swagger and selective reality will never patch up racism. I'm American. I have eroded your hyphenation. I'm American. I come from Mexican ancestry. I'm American. I terrorize you uncompartmentalized. And while diversity is sold on billboards and sitcoms out by desperate house wives as sexy Latina maids, cha-cha chying their ways into the American dream. I am not as easily crafted into your restraints as humble day laborer. I am not the voice from behind the door with the patrona's baby on her hip saying, no, 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 la señora no está. My poetry supersedes the pictorial. My memories demand I tell stories. And these are the realities in my barrio where my poetry is not for you only because you say so, where babies have babies and loved ones get lost to addictions, where there is no 401ks or IRAs, far away from your picket white fence and the privilege of your middle class. I am a drawbridge, an island of a woman, and I am tired of internalizing and assimilating your mestizalist theories. I am a drawbridge, an island of a woman, and my existence will continue to push up against the boundaries of the acceptable and traditional. I am a drawbridge, an island of a woman, Woman, and I implore you, Chavala, to hook into a snip of my lived realities, to look past our cultural differences, to refuse to let language be a barrier, to stop expecting me to assimilate. I am a drawbridge, an island of a woman. I am a sandbar. And because you are so young, I will function as your bridge. As one of my poems. And sorry about that. My voice is um, trying to week out on me, but I wanted to be here with y'all uh, and read some work. Um, I am going to read a few more poems that are a little bit more laid back that don't require me to hold back so much. Um, and these are my postcards to Gloria. Um, throughout the years as I've been living so far away from the Rio Grande Valley, it has been these postcards to Gloria that have allowed me to stay connected to Anzaldúa, and this one is called Pine, Palming Limestone, and it was written when I lived in Lind, Washington. So, El Frío de Washington Spring plays a humdrum game of hide and seek, y como coneja amorosa he salido from my little womb of a house and have sat on the steps dejando a tu Julio Cortazar dentro tomando café. The tall shadows of your clothes, the tall shadows you clothe in male garbs, do not follow me to the post office. Estoy sola en viejitos Gringolandia, standing under the dead pine trees. Y mi viejo el sabelo nada de plantas y jardines told me echándoles el lawnmower por encima that the grape highest hyacinth flowers que chuliaba were nothing more que hierbas majaderas kin to milk weeks and dandelions. Pero que saben ellos de rasquach-esque bell-shaped fragrant flowers like me? Si aquí la tierra is littered with pine needles and not mesquite pods. Que saben ellos? 
que nunca han visto a Yemayá con su cowboy boots y en bikinis besando el sol de la isla. ¿Qué saben ellos de los poetas naufragadas who palm the limestone, the limestone tokens of your graves, deconstructing and reconstructing a borderland too far away to forget? Um, uh, a poem called After Servicide. Um, and if someone could tell me when I'm out of time, no tengo, no tengo a uh, stopwatch. So thank you. Um, so this is After Servicide, um, a poem that I wrote for Gloria also from Desde Washington 395. Today I saw two venaditas on the crest leading up to the entrance ramp of 395 and I thought of you. I wondered if Washington venadas are different than Valley venadas. Do they like empanadas? Would they prefer ruby reds to galas? Do they speak with calo tongues? Do Washington venadas know La Llorona? Have they grown unafraid of corralling the father? Would Washington Washington venadas refuse to leave La Prieta home. Instead, and sit, they sit, instead, insist that they sit and wait for the warden and his hounds. U.S. Route 395, Washington, Gonzafos. And then one more poem is, and that one comes out in Iman Iman, um, edited by Irene Lara Silva and Dan Vera. If you don't have it, definitely get it. Um, so, um, here, so this is postcard to La Gloria, there's a poem in Washington, Dear Gloria. Here in the crossword, crossroads with those colorless niños who pride themselves in not seeing color, who keep complaining that all lives should matter and not just black ones, I am exhausted. I'm tired of being a crossroad. My mestiza consciousness is in healing the split between me and all the mondados in the Palouse. Yes, La Raza and I still live in fronteras, surviving the borderlands, but here where there are only rolling hills and wheat fields, pine trees and snow covered mountaintops, no se ve la rajada that divides a culture. Los niños fleeing Central America are bedtime stories or of welfare parasites and pandemic disease bombs on pause. Se cansa uno of kicking with both feet. And when we pour out the images in our head for the changes we wish to see, administrators pat us kindly and congratulate us on being so articulate. But all is not hopeless. We keep finding each other here, meeting and dancing in the face of it all. And do not worry, Prieta, we remain on both sides through separate to the serpent and eagle eyes, watchando y acordando, surviving, being a crossroad. Forever your chola, Lady Mariposa. Um, and in closing, I just want to say that um, uh, in this new gig that I got at Portland Community College, um, I, I keep, you know, I am from the borderlands. I teach Gloria. She's in my syllabus. But Gloria always like comes at me. Um, cuando no la espero. And, and of course, that always leads me back home. So if I had a final postcard, it would be the postcard I wrote the day after the first day of class that we uh, taught. And um, I had my students read Movimientos de Rebeldía y la Culturas que Traicionan in my writing 115 class. Um, and I had a, a young girl or a young lady from Venezuela read me the Spanish portion of Ansaldúa. Um, and as she read it, this classroom in Portland, Wash in Portland, Oregon, was filled with this beautifully eloquent Spanish that Gloria had written, and I was moved to tears. Um, and I explained to the students that getting my PhD was a pretty big deal, um, and that being able to, to show them and have them read Gloria in this space meant a lot to me and what it was to have that Spanish reverberating off of the walls of the academy, right? Right. So I just wanted to to uh, thank Gloria with the final postcard that says um, September 29th, 2022. Dear Gloria, for reminding me of who I am and where I come from. Gracias. Como Tortuga, your work and your words continue to be the home I carry on my back. Always your homegirl, Doctora Lady Mariposa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. And it's it's so special to start this night with um, with Gloria and seeing her impact, especially given how much impact she's had on Aunt Lute in our existence. Um, yeah, so thank you for sharing those beautiful 
Um, Next up, I'm excited to introduce Ginny Z. Beerson. Ginny is a longtime political activist driven by a longing for justice. She was a member of the Furies, a radical lesbian feminist separatist collective in Washington, D.C. that lived and worked collectively to develop lesbian feminist political thought and philosophy, and they produced a monthly newspaper, the Furies, and it was distributed nationally, had a impact on women's groups all over the U.S., uh, and Ginny was a regular contributor and member of the editorial staff. And after they broke up, Ginny pulled together a group of women in D.C. to begin visioning and planning what would become Olivia Records, the national women's record company. She and her partner, the musician Meg Christensen, were the initial driving force getting Olivia off the ground. Uh, and Ginny stayed at Olivia for seven plus years. And during that time, the Olivia Collective produced records by Meg, Chris Williamson, Bibi Kiroche, uh, Linda Tillery, Teresa Troll, Mary Watkins, a poetry album by Pat Parker and Judy Gron, and Lesbian Concentrate, a lesbian anthology in response to a rising wave of homophobia. Uh, and after leaving Olivia in 1980, Ginny worked for many years in community radio at KPFA FM, Pacifica Radio, National Federation of Community Broadcasters, and she now works as Director of Outreach for World Trust Educational Services, an anti-racist educational organization that produces documentary films, curricula, workshops, and trainings. She also does racial equity work in her neighborhood as part of Neighbors for Racial Justice. And most recently, she was pub published uh, by Aunt Lute, uh, Olivia on the Record, which won the Forward Indies 2020 Silver Award um, and in LGBTQ fiction um, and the Independent Press Award for um, LGBTQ nonfiction and the Golden Crown Literary Awards for nonfiction. Uh, so welcome, Ginny. Thank you, Emma. And thank you, uh, Veronica, that was beautiful. And um, I'm so happy to be here. And I love Aunt Lute. So um, I'm gonna just give you a little background here. Um, in March, 1972, Meg Christian and I became lovers. Uh, Meg was a musician, a brilliant guitarist and singer who was performing in all the major nightclubs in Washington, DC and frequently getting fired for bringing in the wrong clientele. I guess having a table with four lesbians in a room full of heterosexual couples was just too unnerving for the club management. Anyway, I decided to become Meg's manager, about which I knew nothing, but I figured I could get her some gigs at women's colleges and women's centers on the East Coast, and I did. And then in January 1973, I invited some friends to our house to talk about what shape our feminist political activism would take next. Meg was not yet writing her own songs, that would come later. So that's a little background about what I'm gonna read first. Meg spent a lot of time in record stores looking for songs that she could cover. One day she discovered an album by Garn Little Dyke in the bargain bin. The album was called Wichita Lineman and on the cover was a straight but tough looking woman leaning against a telephone pole. Meg could hardly contain her excitement. Had she found an unknown lesbian singer on a major label? Alas, Garn Little Dyke was a man. But Meg's bargain bin hunting was not always fruitless. That's where she first discovered Chris Williamson. Chris had recorded an album for Ampex shortly before Ampex started producing records. The record went nowhere commercially, but it went right into Meg's heart and repertoire. One song in particular, Joanna, got her attention. Joanna was a song about female friendship and caring that didn't follow the usual verse chorus verse chorus formula and that made it musically interesting. Meg began performing it regularly and always credited Chris as the songwriter. And so it was that when in the spring of 1973, Chris made her first trip to the DC area for a concert, the room was filled with women women who knew of Chris because Meg had been singing her songs and promoting the gig. Chris started in on Joanna, but almost immediately forgot some of the words. She was visibly shocked when half the audience started filling in the words and singing the song. After the concert, Meg introduced herself to Chris and asked her what she thought about women's music. By now, Chris had heard of Meg. Apparently dozens of women had told her that Meg Christian was singing some of her songs. But Chris didn't have a clue about women's music. 
Of course not. Meg had just invented the term. Meg handed her a tape she had made and invited Chris to dinner at her house. Meg and I were nervous wrecks as we prepared for the dinner. We wanted to impress Chris, and there was so much about her that was so impressive to us. She wrote her own songs. She had recorded an album. She had a gorgeous, wide-ranging voice. She came from California. All these things were a bit intimidating to me. Meg was hoping to find a musical kindred spirit. We didn't even know if she was a lesbian. On the one hand, there were no references to men in any of her songs. She performed in pants. She exuded what we, what we were hoping was a lesbian vibe. On the other hand, she had long hair that she was forever flipping back. And she arrived at our house with her manager, a guy named Peter. Chris and Peter arrived late and we were not pleased to see him. We thought she was using Peter as a shield. We didn't know how we would be able to talk to her about feminism and lesbianism with Peter there. We all tried to cover our anxiety in our own ways. Meg drank a lot of wine. I acted tough and disinterested. Chris immediately started doing yoga poses on the living room floor. Within five minutes, she was doing shoulder stands and planks and lunges. I don't think we had ever seen anyone do yoga before. She talked about energy and vibes. Chris kept saying that in California, the leash was a little longer than in Washington, DC. We thought she was one of the strangest people we had ever met. We hung out for several hours, eyeing each other warily and talking about nothing of consequence. We made a tuna noodle casserole for dinner, which was something we ate pretty regularly. We didn't want Chris to think we were anything but cool, and so we didn't want to appear to be trying to impress her. We definitely succeeded in not impressing her. And the tuna noodle casserole later became the butt of much joking from the stage by both Meg and Chris. Just a few weeks after that bizarre dinner, we met up again with Chris. Our friends Chris James and Cheryl Smith were part of a feminist radio collective called Sophie's Parlor, which broadcast from the radio station at Georgetown University. When Chris and Cheryl decided to interview Chris Williamson, they invited Meg and me to participate in the interview. So on a spring afternoon in 1973, we all piled into the small studio at WGTB and found our places around the table. Mics were set up and adjusted. The interview began in a low key fashion with some typical questions about how long she had been performing, how did she write, et cetera. After we all loosened up a bit, we started making jokes about women's tap dance companies and women's puppet shows. We asked Chris about her experience with Ampex and she spoke of how frustrating it was for her to have so little control of the process of making the record. And then she said, why don't you start a women's record company? And that was it. I knew immediately what I was going to do. I did not have one second of doubt. After that, I talked to everyone I knew about starting a women's record company and invited them all to join. The 10 of us who had met in January showed up and Meg and I presented the case for a record company. By the end of the meeting, we had agreed. On that night and over the next few months, we began to outline a set of basic principles that would guide us. We created a set of documents elucidating our vision, our strategy, and some of the rules of the game. The preamble said, this record company was started by lesbian feminists to provide a means of equalizing economic, cultural in inequalities which exist in this country. We believe that women and therefore lesbians are oppressed by the heterosexual and capitalistic institutions already in existence, and we are committed to finding ways within the company of alleviating class, race, and heterosexual privilege. Because women have been denied the means of communicating their music and their culture, we intend to seek out and encourage women's musical achievements. Finally, we are committed to producing quality recordings of quality music. We listed all the departments, how they would function, how they would interact with each other, how women would be hired and fired. We established a grievance procedure, a salary structure, a method for handling disputes. We insisted that all meetings would be held during regular working hours and that all financial records would be accessible to everyone. We would operate collectively. We would work exclusively with women. We would treat all women with respect. We would record music that celebrated all aspects of women's lives. We would operate with transparency. We would not create a hierarchy or star system. 
We believe that all work was valuable and should be equally compensated and honored. We wanted to create an alternative economic institution that would eventually enable us to control all the means of production and to employ hundreds or thousands of women in well-paying jobs, doing meaningful work with opportunities to learn new skills and to become part of the decision-making collective. We would be as non-capitalistic as possible. We believed we were acting with integrity from a set of feminist values that we all subscribe to and were living to the best of our abilities. I believe that we would create a model for feminism that would be irresistible. This is what feminism looks like, I want in. It never crossed our minds that knowing nothing about making records would be a problem. Uh, there were feminist monthly newsletters in almost every city in the US and in many small towns as well. And we had access to them because of our work with the Furies. We sent notices to all of them that essentially said, we are starting a women's record company. And if anybody knows anything about any aspect of this, please let us know. We also decided to go directly to the source. I wrote letters to four or five of the major record labels that said, I am a high school student and I have to write a paper on how to start a record company. Can you please tell me what to do? We actually got replies, although they were completely useless. One said, you need a million dollars, so forget about it, or it's too complicated to explain, so find another project. Meanwhile, I was booking concerts for Meg for the summer of 1973 and we planned a cross country trip that would end in the fabled state of California. Using the feminist press and the mailing list of subscribers from the Furies in DC's Feminist Monthly off our backs, I approached women everywhere and asked if they would produce a concert of women's music. The interest and willingness were immediate and extraordinary. Almost nobody had production experience, but that was irrelevant. Um, I barely knew anything myself. However, I was one step ahead of them. Find a hall and book it. Print up some posters and plaster them wherever women hang out. Sell tickets. Theatrical lighting was a plus, but if the best we could do was keep a row of overhead lights on the stage and lower the rest of the house, that would work. I would run the sound. We packed the car and hit the road, unaware of what a great and fortuitous adventure this trip would turn out to be. So, <clears throat> One of the women that we met on this trip was Joan Lowe. Joan had her own record label and she produced and engineered children's records. Joan was one of the people who responded to our plea for anyone who knew anything about anything about how to be a record company. She knew quite a bit. And Meg and I spent some time with her at her home on the Mackenzie River in Vida, Oregon. Joan really taught us so much. And she suggested that instead of starting out by making an album, we produce a 45 instead. We thought this was a great idea. And when we got back to DC, the rest of the collective agreed. And we decided that we would use it to raise money so we could start to be a real record company. We made a list of every woman we thought would be supportive of a women's record label and would be willing and able to donate large amounts of money. Knowing nothing at all about fundraising, we crafted a letter in which we laid out the bleak landscape for women in the music business, how they had neither control over their music and careers nor power in the industry, how they were put in boxes and not allowed to break out, and how that resulted in wasted talent, unfulfilled dreams, and an audience of women frustrated by a culture that did not reflect their lives. We followed that with our vision of Olivia. We wanted to tantalize them with the possibilities that a woman identified boldly feminist music company could mean for them and for all women. We talked about women as recording engineers, record producers, instrumentalists. What could they envision for themselves if they were able to make all the decisions about what songs to record, which musicians to work with, how to shape the sound, what art should grace the album cover, how the artist and the album should be promoted. We also talked about the importance of building feminist institutions that would demonstrate the real meaning of feminism, as opposed to how the mainstream media defined it on a daily basis. And then we asked them to make, it, to make a donation. The letter went out to dozens and dozens of people. I'm not gonna give you the whole list here, it's in the book, but it's everyone from Joni Mitchell and Aretha Franklin and Mary Clayton and Maya Angelou and Gloria Steinem, et cetera, and members of our family. 
Other than our family members, we had addresses for none of them. All we had were the names and addresses of their record labels or management companies uh, or national organizations. I would guess that almost none of our letters ever made it to the women we sent them to with three exceptions. A musician named Harriet Schock, who was recording on a major label at that time and was happy to support our fledgling operation, sent $25. Meg's uncle sent $50. And Yoko Ono sent an invitation to meet with her. Yoko Ono. We didn't know very much about her, except that her music was like nothing we had ever heard before. It was very dissonant. And if there were lyrics, they were incomprehensible to us. The other thing we knew about her was that she was married to John Lennon, and so probably had a lot of money. She was doing a performance at the Smithsonian Museum in January 1974 and asked us to come to her hotel room before the show and meet with her. Uh, it was decided that Meg and I would meet with her, and the collective met for hours trying to figure out how best to approach her. There was no internet, so no way to Google her and get background. In the end, we decided to just be direct. We also decided we had better dress up, which meant wearing pants other than jeans and possibly even putting on a bra, but possibly not. We tried to act very cool, but I was quite nervous. As much as I didn't want to admit it, I couldn't stop thinking that this woman was married to one of the Beatles. I had no idea who she was in her own right. We went up to her room and she opened the door with a smile. She was so small. Her dark hair was pulled back in a ponytail and she wore loose patterned pants and a blousey artsy top. We introduced ourselves. Welcome, she said, holding out her hand. Please come in. Would you like some tea? Yes, please, said Meg at the same moment that I said, no, thank you. We rolled our eyes at each other. I felt so clumsy. She pulled a brown cigarette out of a pack with a French name that I had never heard of. I pulled out my pack of Marlboros, relieved that I wouldn't have to get through this without smoking. Yoko poured a cup of tea for Meg and we sat down. She had draped pieces of fabric on the boxy hotel furniture and made it seem warmer and softer. She kept the curtains closed, but had candles lit. The impression was of being in a cave or a womb. There was a slight whiff of incense, enough to suggest a mood, but not enough to overwhelm. We sat uncomfortably on a stiff sofa while she sat in a wingback chair. She looked directly at us and almost whispered, Tell me your ideas. Meg and I launched into our story. Yoko listened intently. Yes, I know how badly women are treated in the music business, she said. I am full of creativity and I am not taken seriously. I would like to help you. Feeling emboldened now, I said we needed money so that we could make our first record. Would she make a donation? I will not give you money, but I will be happy to give you one of my songs and to record it for you and you can sell it. What a stunning offer, an offer that we were completely unprepared to accept. How could we possibly fit the music of Yoko Ono into our idea of women's music? Who would buy a record with her music on it? Did this have even the slightest chance of feeding women's hunger or building a foundation for a feminist institution? We told her that we already had contracted with two musicians for our first record and thank, thank you very much anyway. Let me know if you change your mind, she said, as she got up to show us out. I have respect for what you wanna do. And then we left. We really had no idea why she was reaching out to us. We were so wrapped up in our own story that we didn't pay attention to hers to see where, to see where there was common ground. Yoko Ono was an outsider, commercially not viable, too anti-establishment. The music press and Beatles fans blamed her for breaking up the Beatles. She was considered a joke and a harridan by the male music establishment. In retrospect, it's easy to see what we had missed in potential connections, but I think it was actually the right decision. We needed our first statement to be more directly and intimately linked to the feminist and lesbian feminist movements. We wanted our artists to tour as part of the concert production network we were beginning to establish around the country. And we wanted music that was more accessible that, than Yoko's was, especially at that time. But because she didn't offer us what we wanted, we dismissed her and never looked back. If you want to know who we did record, you'll have to read the book. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. 
I, <laughs> I've been meaning to send you this passage really reminds me of this. I'm outing myself as frivolous, but I keep on getting these TikTok audio memes of like people saying like, um, no, I don't know anything about how to do blank, but I am gay and my homosexual audacity means that I will do it. Okay. If you <laughs> reminds me of this passage. Uh-huh. Thank you so much for Thank reading you. and joining us. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next up, I'm super excited because we have our newest author that Aunt Lute is just beginning to work with. We just started our conversation earlier this summer. Uh, her name is Kathia Alexander. Kathia is a writer, a playwright, storyteller, and teaching artist. She was a writer in residence at the prestigious Hedgebrook Women Writers Retreat and won the Fringe First Award for Black to My Roots, African American Tales from the Head and the Heart at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe in Edinburgh, Scotland for Outstanding New Production and Innovation in Theater. And she's also won awards from Four Culture, Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, Artist Trust, Jack Straw, Seattle Theater Group, Freehold Theater, and Seattle Parks and Recreation. She was a freelance writer for the award-winning Colors NW Magazine and is a regular contributor to the South Seattle Emerald. She has been published in the Pitkin Review, Arcana Literary Magazine, Pontoon Poetry slash Black Lawrence Press, and Native Skin Magazine. She has also been published in anthologies by the African American Writers Alliance and in Raising Lily Ledbetter, Women Poets Occupy the Workplace by Lost Horse Press. Her playwriting credits include the Negro Passion Play, Black Dick Matters, Hands Up, Don't Shoot, Think Before You Do, With Hope and With Mourning, David and Jonathan, A Modern Day Retelling of the Biblical Story, Homegoing, A Revolution of Hope, Emotional Black Male, Human Nature, Dreamin', Native Sons and Daughters, and Nappy Roots, A Fairy Tale. So welcome, Kathia. Thank you. I'm so excited. <laughs> so this is from my manuscript for the novel. Right now, the title is Keep a Living, and I'm starting with the prologue, The Land of Us. Now there come a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan come late. He God's son too. And the Lord says, Satan, now where was you? Then Satan answered the Lord and say, from going to and fro upon the earth and from walking all up and down in it. The Lord says, you don't found any of my servants who is as diligent as thou art. And Satan answered and said, no, Lord, not one. And the Lord said to Satan, has thou considered my servant Baal, that perfect woman who fear me and hold me in her heart? She escheweth evil and loved the Lord. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does she fear you for naught? Has thou not made a hedge about her and about all her house and about all she hath on every side? Thou hast blessed her with the work of her hands, and her substance increaseth in the land. But put forth thine hand and touch all she hath, and she will curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, didn't we go through this before when you convinced me to torture my servant Job? And did you not learn in that time that there are some souls as diligent as thine? And Satan answered the Lord and said, yea, but thy servant Job, was he not a man, one that in his day wielded authority and power? Bell ain't nothing but a co-colored co woman living in a land that don't care nothing about her. Take away the hedge thou hast placed about her. Verily I say, touch all she had and she will curse you to your face. And the almighty God said unto Satan, behold, all she hath is in thy power. Only upon herself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of God. Chapter one, angels and us. The heat flowed down the hall and danced off the walls of my bedroom. Mama in the kitchen, she got the oven on for the biscuits she making. 
the sound she make when she fluffed the dough with her hands is what wake me up. Whoop, 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 the dough say, like it is talking to mama, telling her if she got the consistency right. I don't wake up to the sound of my mama making biscuits every morning, every day for all of my life, every day. Not just in the middle of winter, but every day, no matter how hot the weather already is. This is summer in Arkansas. My head hurting so bad I can't even sit up. Today, the 4th of July, so even though it's scorching hot, my mama done already started cooking a pot of turnip greens. I can tell by the smell. It ain't even seven o'clock yet, but it's already hot as hell in our house. Mama also is cooking our breakfast. She made biscuits and gravy, pork chops and bacon, some other potatoes with onions, and she is boiling some more potatoes for the potato salad that she making for later on. Today is also Mama's birthday. I have got her a present. I pay for it with the money that I make from cutting data, running to the store, getting her Kent cigarettes and short coats. It ain't much because cutting data don't really pay all that much. I plan to get mama something really nice for her birthday. I asked daddy if he would come and take me to town so I could go shopping at Sterling Department Store. He said that he would, but then he didn't come home. I guess he was at the church having a deacon meeting or something. Mama get mad at him because he didn't show up. I know she get mad sometimes for him doing his preacher business. So I had planned to jump out of bed to show her how much I love her. But it is too hot. My head feel like it's split. Mama cook like this every day, but I don't usually get sick. When I asked her one time why she cooked such a big breakfast, she said it come from growing up on a farm when she little and the men would go out to the fields after breakfast. Well, not just the men, she said women work the fields too. I told her it would be all right if we just eat a tuna fish sandwich and she started yelling at me at the top of her lungs. I do not understand it. She act like I told her that I didn't want to eat none of her food. And of course, would nobody never say nothing like that because everything she cook be screaming, good, good. My head is pounding and I feel sick to my stomach. Every breath that I take fill my lungs with hot air. I try to lift my head so I can get out of the bed, but Arrows of pain shoot through all through my scalp and my neck. I can hear mama take the top off the pot that the green's in. I hear the sound of the spoon scraping against the side of the cooker. I can see in my mind the dish towel on her apron she used to wipe the sweat off her face. I hear her take the sugar bowl off of the table to sprinkle in the pot. She say you have to use a little sugar so the greens won't be bitter. She mashed the leaves down into the pot liquor that she make from the fat that she seasoned the greens with. She called it strictoline bacon. The air coming from my fan feel real damp and real warm. I hear Sissy in the living room. She is mopping the floor. She like to do her work in the morning in the cool of the day, but ain't no such a thing really with mama cooking the way that she do every morning. I do not understand how she can be in that kitchen. I hear her pull the pan from out of the oven, the biscuit dough finally ready. I can hear the radio in her bedroom. It sounds scratchy with static. Sweet Willie Wine, the DJ, talking about the Children's Crusade. That's a bunch of colored children down to Birmingham, Alabama. And the things that they did, that's done changed everything. My brother Quentin was a DJ on the same radio station before he leave Little Rock and moved to Jackson, Mississippi. 
Now he a DJ in Jackson for WOKJ. Although he moved around a lot following all the civil rights demonstrations and reporting on the radio all the things that go on. Today, Birmingham taking the whites only signs down. If I did not see it for myself, I wouldn't have never believed it. Daddy say, Belle, this go to show you that God can use anything. Mama say, God ain't told nobody to use now one of these children. See, back in April, Reverend Martin Luther King had planned a big march to force integration in Birmingham. He had planned for Negroes to turn out in large numbers and for them to all get arrested. But didn't hardly nobody show up, so he went to jail himself. And he wrote a letter to all of the white preachers talking about them real bad because they wouldn't get involved in help. Mom said, AD, one, man, one day that man is going to get himself killed. I try to move my head again, but it feel like some daggers is stabbing me in my eyes so bad that I can't see. I know I need to get out of bed and go help my mama, but all I really want to do is to go back to sleep. Everybody else already woke. Since today a holiday seemed like for just one day, it would be all right for me to stay in bed as long as I feel like. But since mama is cooking for the 4th of July, I know she want me to help her out in the kitchen. She always make me wash the dishes and all the forks and spoons as soon as she used them. I hate washing dishes. This year the 4th fall on a Friday, so mama got to leave for work soon. I want to tell mama about my headache when it hurt to open my eyes up. My head feel like bombs is going off inside my skull. I get headaches a lot, mostly when it's time to start school, but sometimes I get them when I get too hot too. Mama cooked like we have got air conditioning or something, but don't nobody have air conditioning in us where we live? Folk think being cool is just a total waste of money. So it is mostly just white folks that have air conditioning. Like the white woman house that my mama work at. I like playing over there when my mama go to clean. Her white lady got two twin girls that's about my same age, and they mama let us play in the sprinklers and everything. Don't nobody in us have no sprinklers neither. Mama say the Lord made the grass and he also made the rain. So why she want to run her water bill up when if the good Lord made it, he will always provide a way to make it grow. Then she started to complain. I have a hard enough time getting anybody to even cut the grass. All y'all lazy children laying around the house all summer and not now one of y'all cut the yard unless I ask. And then she started talking again about how children is ungrateful. Every story she tells seemed to come back to that. I throw the sheet off myself, but I still can't open up my eyes yet. I wait to see if the bombs in my head gonna sell down a little bit. I hear mama turn the water on again in the sink. Sound like she is washing more greens for our dinner. But then I hear her take the mixing bowl out. That means she making a cake. Her cakes is my favorite. And that's when I smell the custard for the homemade ice cream. She just put in the vanilla. The smell swam down the hall. Well, she might have put it in the cream before that. Sometimes you can't smell stuff from the kitchen for a long time. It's like when Lucky be cooking at night. By the time the smell come and wake you up, he already be through eating with whatever he cooked. He always smile when he tell me all the pork chops is gone. Look, make me sick. He loved being in the kitchen with mama whenever he be at home so he know how to cook. And she loved to teach him all of her recipes. I might could do that, but it is just too hot. 
when I get too hot, seem like the world start to spin it. Seem like I start to wheeze it and I can't hardly catch my breath. One time when I was six, I fall on the floor screaming. Mom just look at me and say, Mandy, if you don't get up off of that floor, acting like you ain't got no sense, I'm going to give you something for you to fall on the floor about. She act like I fall on the floor because I like it. I can't help how I act when I get hot like that. It made me feel like some arms is holding me too tight, trying to cut off all of my circulation. And I have this thing about being closed in. It makes me go crazy, stark, stiff, and raving. Think that come from living in us. Us is a small Negro settlement across the Arkansas River in North Little Rock. Did nobody found it? Did nobody settle it? It ain't on no map that I know of. Sometimes I wonder if that means it don't really exist. Except everybody in Arkansas seem to know about us. A lot of white folk even come here because we famous for our fishing. The trees real tall and the people real short. They walk stooped over and close to the ground, careful to watch each place where they put their foot, lest they stray from the narrow path they is allowed to trod. It is a land of daffodils and willows that weep, sunflowers and all of the little color girl's hair grow wild from the rain that mama's, mama's catching ten tubs. Look at the corner of any house and you'll find one there. The old ladies and us pat my head with their hands and then gnarled fingers reach out and caress me around my throat. Mama say God created the heavens and the earth and then he made us with the stuff he have left. The very air in us is stale and sweet. The creeks is as clear as they is deceiving. The stars shine brighter, the night is more black. And the people stay rooted and grounded in believing things that don't make no sense to me no more. Like all this, thou shalt not, thou will not, said the Lord. And if I say anything to mama about it, she say, that's what it's saying, his holy word. That is what her answer is, to everything is. Folks seem to get wider and thicker each year. In us, you can't have no independent thought. I think that come from having so much fear, scared of God and scared to live without him, scared to walk and scared to sit. Because if you stray from off the straight and narrow, the devil always there to throw you into his pit. It ain't no harmony in us. Everything sound flat and everybody sing in the same low key. Change of chords ain't something that's allowed in this town, or that's how it's done always seemed to, like to me. I hear mama take the biscuits from out of the oven. She started to humming as she take them into the dining room and sit them on the hot pad that she put on the table. Then my mama started to moan an old Dr. Watts hymn. She is gonna start to singing in a minute. That is what she always do. I can tell what kind of mood she gonna be in by the song that she sang. This morning she choose, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, oh, whether shall I go? Thank you. Kathia, oh my goodness. <laughs> that was beautiful. Also, this is, I mean, you all are experiencing this for the first time, but this is also the first time we've heard Kathia read her own work. It was such a, such an amazing, it's such a different experience. Thank uh, you. We'll have to do an audio book. <laughs> that's what we were just saying. We were sneakily texting. <laughs> just like, we'll need to do an audio book. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Katya.
All right. Next up, this is such a such an excellent time. Thank you all for being a part of this. Um, next up, we have Irene Lara Silva. Um, and Irene is the author of four poetry collections, Furia, Blood Sugar Canto, Quica Kali, House of Song, and First Poems. Uh, two chapbooks, uh, Enduring Azucares and Hibiscus Tacos, and a short story collection, Flesh to Bone, which won the Premio Aztlan. Uh, she and poet Dan Vera are also the co-editors of Flesh to Bone, or not Flesh to Bone, sorry, Iman Iman, Poets Writing in the Enzalduan Borderlands, and it's a collection of poetry and essays. Irene is the recipient of the 2021 Tessa Hugh Writers Grant, a 2017 NALAC Fund uh, for the Arts Grant, and the final Alfredo Cisneros del Moral Award, and was the fiction finalist for a Rojo's 2013 Gift of Freedom Award. And most recently, Irene was awarded the 2021 Texas Institute of Letters Shrake Award for Best Short Nonfiction. Irene is currently a writer at large for Texas Highways Magazine and is working on a second collection of short stories titled The Light of Your Body. So welcome, Irene. I'm so excited. I'll bring my face back at the end. All right, here we go. So I wanted to say thank you, uh, Emma and Shay and Joan, and, and of course, many thanks and many congratulations to uh, to Aunt Lute for the, you know, for 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 my amazing experiences for the essential literature that Aunt Lute has published, and um, and it's just it's it, it continues to be amazing. Um, I wanted to read something new and something old, so I'm going to read to you all from. Uh, a short story that I hardly ever get to read from um, that's in flesh to bone. And that's from uh, Desembocada, the mouth of the river. And it has a little epigram. Um, I want so much to pray sounds that my hot mouth cannot find. And that's from Franz uh, X Capus. And if that name at all sounds familiar, that's the poet that Rilke is writing to in letters to a young poet. But I just, I love that line. Um, and, uh, oh, the other thing to say before I jump into the story is that I'm very fascinated by, um, by gods, goddesses. I, I tend to use them interchangeably. Um, so whether I say gods or goddesses, I mean, uh, I mean both all gendered and genderless at the same time. All right. So beginning of this short, of this short story. One. How soft her thighs under my hands, under my lips, the muscles leaping to my grasp, to my breath. No intelligible words from her mouth, only a musical keening I heard myself echoing. She had such black eyes, the blackness of combustion, immolation. The heat rising from her skin created a smoky haze that enveloped us both. Nothing beyond her had depth or shape or light. Inside me, a thundering need to touch her, to fill my body with the sight and feel and taste of her. Under her touch, my body yielded and demanded. Her body, women's woman sweet and woman curved, woman's body rhythmic and passionate against me, the softness of her breasts against mine. Tangled breath and tangled sighs, bodies without boundaries, only rising heat. I cried out and looked into her eyes, a river of blue flames and a rolling thunder that shook every particle of my being. Two. She came to me in a dream, and in my dream it is night and the field of tawny grass is silvered in the moonlight. Darkness has devoured the stars and clouds stampede across the sky in great purpled herds. In the distance the mountains are only a more silent darkness. I see a point of light. And as she comes closer, it becomes a moonlight pulling on her belly and thighs, her face and shoulders. Golden light radiates from her open palms, flows in her wake. Her eyes are terribly black, without whites, without irises, black and hungry, implacable and silent. The tall grass swaying in the wind whispers to her as she walks the tips of her fingers brushed against it. Dark shivers run through the grass, rippling and fading. She comes closer and I can't see anything beyond her golden body and her black eyes. I want to call out to her, but I can't speak, can't make any sound. I want to fall on my knees and raise my arms to her, but my body won't move. She comes closer and I think she must stop, must call out my name, 
must reach to touch me. A cloud of crows rises from her hair and twists in the air, rising and falling in a black wave of wings. Three. Blue. In her truest flesh, her skin is blue and casts violet shadows. Blue for sweetness, blue for touch, blue for blessings born softly in the night, petal soft and blue skin, unblemished, unscarred. Spirit made flesh and not holy flesh. Her skin ripples turquoise at my touch. While she sleeps, her breath soft against my crude skin, I can love her. Humble human love. I can lie here loved and sated, quiet and grateful until she opens her immense black eyes and I am devoured again, made small, awed before the divine. Four, pain. She said there would be pain, pain to live, to breathe, to eat. Pain so immense I would have to walk through it. Breathing prayers, I fell into her hands. But I was afraid, afraid for my half-lived life, afraid to risk, unwilling to love. I've always been alone, no lovers, no children, locked in with myself and the unfleshed whispering of my books, binding the world tight around me, a fort of bandages around my heart, a prisoner of my own protections. I feared bleeding again. All the old wounds reopened, salt cleansed and sutured, cauterized by red flame. Five, what strange creatures grief makes of us, at once hollow and brimming over, all things rendered precious, rendered useless, black and silvered waves of memories crashing and crashing, and pain. The searing agony of flesh parting under a jagged knife, blood like violent tears streaming from the wound, the knife carves everything out, bile and rancor, hope and passion, melancholy tenderness. Flames of anguish blacken the inner walls, devouring every useless thing. And when the space is wide enough, quiet enough, grief pours in with such a tremendous pressure, it causes some bodies to burst. Other bodies slowly dissolve, grief running in rivulets from invisible orifices. But when the body can contain molten grief, it forms obsidian walls that seal the parted flesh. For a time, until the day, the moment, something harder than grief strikes the obsidian and it shatters, falling in wide arcs of sharp blades. Inside an emptiness, the wind whistles through. Outside, a wide obsidian flex scars. I heard the wind inside me. I tasted it. It spilled out of my mouth. And that is a little bit of La Desembocada. And if you want the rest, yes, you will have to go get the book. Um, the other thing I wanted to read for y'all, uh, something new. And for those of y'all uh, who don't know the deity, uh, Aztec deity, um, um, we she is, uh, the best way to describe what she looks like is that she is a double serpent headed um, deity with a skirt of serpents and a necklace of hands and hearts. Um, and usually stories about her focus on either the birth of Uzupokli or they focus on her daughter, Goyo Shalki. Um, but I've always been fascinated by what was it that made Gualikwe Gualikwe? What was that moment that happened between her looking more human and her taking on the double serpent heads. And so I wrote this short little piece about that moment, the moment of, of taking on the serpent heads. Live or not live, die or not die, die so that everyone lives, so that the darkness will not be eternal, so that the sun rises again, live so that this is not the end of the story, fourth, fifth, sixth sun, fourth, fifth, sixth world, every world and every sun are precarious. What do you weigh at the end and beginning of time? What is agony and what is sacrifice if your beloved world requires it? What is the body when you are a goddess? When the light of the stars lives in your hands, when the blood roaring from your throat doesn't mean death, when the shattered limbs do not mean helplessness, 
The body has known pain. The body has known death. This body does not surrender. And so the body accepted agony and the body birthed agony, birthed itself. Sacrifice of God flesh. It was not a spilling of light, but blood and red muscle and white bone and vile and awful and weeping that was more fire than salt. Fountains and geysers and roaring oceans of blood all at once, head taken, limbs taken, the torso seizing, breasts laid bare, help hips convulsing and the god sex exposed, and time and no time and before time and after time all collapse. This is the moment of origin, the moment of choice when neither the name before nor the name after will encompass the story, where the divine and the flesh meet implacable will, because death is the end of effort, the end of pain. To live is infinite work. To survive is infinite struggle. To, serve and to endure is an infinite cycling of pain. To transform an infinite act of creation. The body chooses life. And choosing life, fountains of blood become serpents. Seize them, and two of their heads shall be your head. Two identical heads facing each other, infinitesimally close, infinitesimally distant, creating the illusion of one symmetrical serpent face. Transform or die. And your limbs, now gone, also become serpent, also become talent, also, be also become talon, also become monster. What is monster in the face of the divine? Is not all the divine monster somehow to the human? Do not fear the monster within. The divine made flesh is always monstrous. Breathe. Blood made of muscle. Fists clenched and relaxed. Flesh and stone. Face and stone. The heart is never stone. The heart is an infinite volcano of blood. Breathe and the body moves. Breathe and see that the world has not ended, is not ended, will not end. Breathe and see this body reflected and not. Breathe and the serpent mouth, the sibilant serpent tongues whisper, I am the mother of myself first. How many are there? Serpents her skirt, and hearts her skirt, and stars her skirt, and lightning her skirt, and flowers her skirt, and more. All the sisters, all the not sisters, infinite and infinitely reflected. Tears and blood and God flesh and sweat and willing sacrifice and all the light within and the choice and the monstrous and the breathing and all the stars and all the serpents. And this is how the world never ends. Thank you. Oh my goodness, Irene. This is my first time hearing you read. I know I'm late to the party. That was beautiful wow thank you all I want to invite everyone I guess all of our readers to turn your cameras back on if you're still here um so that I can thank you all it's such a such an honor to be in this space and hearing from you and like directly from you all as as it's I feel like how, how it's intended to be read and it's been so much fun and really beautiful and thank you to you thank you to our listeners to our attendees and to everyone who donated that's been so kind and thank you all again so much we've got survey links and donation links in the chat um, and we will send out the recording and we'll publish it on our website so you can share it around um but i hope you all have a wonderful weekend thank you so much or weekend evening it's wednesday um may we change the world with this work Thank you so much. All right. Goodbye, everybody.